Hello and welcome to everyone joining us this afternoon, um, everyone in the room here and everyone joining us online as well. It's really nice to see you here for the second day of HISTFest 2024. If you fancy tweeting or posting on social media about this, please do use the hashtag HISTFest2024, that would be great. Um, my name is Rebecca and I'm going to be chairing this event, but first of all I'm going to just run through a couple of housekeeping points just for you to remember. If you have questions, there'll be an opportunity to do, to do that at the end of the session. Um, if you're in the room, just raise your hand and we'll come around with a roaming mic. If you're watching this online, you can put your question in the question box and we'll try to put as many of the questions to our speakers as possible. Um, there's live speech, speech to text captioning here as well, as well as BSL interpretation, should you need that. And there's another thing I need to remember. Oh, yes, that's it. Claire's doing it. The books. <laughs> um, if you're here, we are selling the books outside as well. Claire's latest book, we've just, just missed the physical copies because it's not quite out yet. What's the date it's out? 16th of May. Everyone remember? Yes, you? please remember. <laughs> please pre-order. If you're watching online, you can you can pre-order, there's a link there. If you're here, you can speak to Blackwells and um, they can sort you out with, with um, a link, as I'm sure, as well. Um, but we, we have other books of Claire's as well that are available to purchase. Um, I think that's all of the housekeeping. There's just one more thing that I need to mention, and that's that, that this event is kindly sponsored by Fellows. So thank you to Fellows. You have been supporters over the last few years, and that's really, really kind of you, so thank you. Um, Joining me for the event today, Spycraft and Espionage, World War II and Beyond. Um, the Beyond is going to do some heavy lifting. <laughs> We're covering lots of different times and, and spaces, but hopefully we can get through all of it. But joining me today, um, first of all, is Claire Mully. Uh, Claire Mully is an award-winning author and broadcaster, primarily focused on female experience during the Second World War. Her books have included The Woman Who Saved Children, about Eglantine Jeb, founder of Save the Children, uh, The Spy Who Loved, on the Polish-born special agent Christina Star uh, Scarbeck, um, a.k.a. Christine Granville, and The Women Who Flew for Hitler, which tells the story of Nazi Germany's only two female test pilots, one of whom tried to save Hitler's life, and while well, one of the others tried to kill him. Um, <laughs> her latest book, Agent Zo, tells the incredible story of Els... I'm, I'm going to mispronounce this, but I should have... I meant to ask this behind... In the Elspieta Zabatska. Elspieta Zabatska. It's really easy, because it's just Zo. OK, OK. Um, and she's a World War II female resistance fighter. Um, I'm also joined by Henry Hemming, who is a Sunday Times best-selling author of seven non-fiction books, including M, Maxwell Knight, MI5's Greatest Spymaster, the Dolman Travel Award shortlisted Misadventure in the Middle East, and the New York Times bestseller, The Ingenious Mr. Pike, which I think has got a different title here, hasn't it? Does, it does, yeah. It's called okay. Churchill's Iceman. Yeah. Churchill's Iceman. Um, and he's written for the Sunday Times, the Daily De Telegraph, Daily Mail, the Times, the Economist, the Financial Times magazine, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post. And his latest book, which you can see here, um, is called Four Shots in the Night, a true story of spies, murder, and justice in Northern Ireland. Um, you are, I did this with the last event I chaired, you are going to have a chance to potentially win a copy of one of these books that you can see in front of you. So get your... Um, spy knowledge to the forefront of your brain. <laughs> Mainly James Bond knowledge, because that's the knowledge that I have. Um, so, without further ado, should we get started? First of all, I'll start with you, Henry, but the same question I'll put to you as well, Claire. Why are we, and why are you, so interested in spies and espionage? Ooh, that's a good question. I think, um, I maybe, so I've done some, some screenwriting, and um, I remember one of the things I learned in screenwriting there's this brilliant book I read, and it said, do you remember that film where there's a couple, and they're sitting at a dinner table, and one of them says to the other, I love you, darling, and she means it. And the guy looks at her and says, I love you too, and he means it. And as the book says, no, because that's never happened in the history of film. What makes film, and what's, what makes a story interesting is some kind of dramatic conflict between what you're saying and what you mean. And if, in a way, that's basically what spies do. They can be saying one thing, but meaning something totally different. It's the kind of the heart of human drama, if you like. And I think, deep down, that's one of the reasons why we're so drawn to the possibility that someone is presenting themselves as X, when in fact they're Y. But maybe beyond that, it's the question of, could I do that? 
could I be a spy? And what would it be like? Yeah. Claire, same question to you. I could not be a spy, but of course <laughs> that is what I would say. <laughs> um, I, I suppose my first book was about the founder of Save the Children, who I just absolutely adore. She hated children. Yeah, she's just fantastic. Um, but I was writing the book, and halfway through, she goes out to the Balkans in what becomes the, second, the First World War and does some human rights-espionage-type work, and that's what really gripped me. And I think I normally write... There's this rich seam of untold or poorly told, sentimentalised um, women's history. And war, in a sense, enables women to take the centre ground. It's that, perhaps it's that irony that, you know, women were recruited for a specific reason for these roles. There was a gender difference and it wasn't for them to be honey traps or mataharis. Um, it was because women in the 1940s, and sometimes still today, um, tend to be overlooked and underestimated, and that enables you, that gives you a bit of an advantage in the world of espionage. Um, and so war has this way of subverting some, some of the usual um, social structures, and women get to take central roles, and I found all of that very interesting. So. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting that you kind of reference this, this kind of almost the femme fatale trope, um, when it comes to women in mm -hmm. fiction and, and literature, because lots of the the most high profile, I mean, you can see two examples behind us, lots of the high profile spy novels and things that have been turned into, into Hollywood films have come from people that have been associated with or directly involved with the intelligence services in the past. But does Hollywood, does fiction get it right? It can sometimes get it largely right. I still remember speaking to um, someone who had worked for the government in intelligence and asked a really similar question. What's been the effect of, of Hollywood, of, of fictional spies on real spies, on the actual kind of business of, of intelligence? And he talked about these two people here and said that the two characters, James Bond and Smiley, George Smiley, invented by Ian Fleming and John le Carre, have both played a really interesting part in terms of recruiting spies in the real world, but also keeping a spy on for a particularly long time. And it was fascinating the way he broke it down. He said, what James Bond does is he can make the idea of being a spy in the first place feel exciting and cool and more dramatic than it basically is because as so many people from that world will tell you, it's usually more boring than it looks on TV. But then there's a the smiley role, and I found this really unexpected. And he said that something about George Smiley, this enigmatic, fascinating character with this deep emotional hinterland you're never quite sure about, he basically said that in terms of being an agent runner, it means that when you're just sitting there staring into space, trying to work out what to say next to your agent, your agent thinks, ah, oh, he's having deep thoughts. Mm. <laughs> he's, uh, <laughs> he's being smiley-esque. This guy's great. <laughs> and, um, and so in that sense, it kind of gave, it gives agent runners a little bit more leeway or just creates a bit more mystique around this, this role. OK. Well, do, you think they, do you think Hollywood gets women well, right? No. I don't. That's a shock. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, interesting with um, Fleming, if this book here, she, if, if anyone's ever heard of Christine Granville, they tend to say, wasn't she in Fleming's Lover? Because there was this story put out, people are nodding, that she was in Fleming's Lover. Actually, there is no evidence for that at all. But um, when she was a child, one of her nicknames was Vesper. Um, after the star, the evening star. But obviously, there's lots of reasons why Ian Fleming could have named his female, you know, first Bond girl, Vesper Lind, like West Berlin, and after a drink and all sorts of things. Um, but in fact, when, he, when Fleming was in America promoting his uh, first Bond book, he was asked by... Um, I'm hesitating, but let's just say gentlemen's magazines. He was asked for, you know, where did he get the inspiration from? And he talked about a few people for Bond. Um, and then without being asked any further, he started talking about Christina Scarbeck. And she had just made all the international headlines for a terrible, terrible, but quite dramatic reason. Um, and so he obviously knew about her. And they had lots of friends in common. Um, and he'd heard about her. And if you read the, the first woman Bond girl, she seems to share a lot of similarities to either sunbathing or in the middle of the action sort of thing that Christine would have done. So there are a lot of commonalities there, and I think he might well have been inspired by her. But I think it totally undersells her, because she's not a Bond girl. She's not even Bond. She's much more Bond than Bond girl, but she's actually the real deal. He's, you know, in male fiction. She was actually out there in three different theatres, longest serving, one of the most effective special agents, male or female, of the war, longest serving of them all. Um, so I don't think we need to reduce people. They're always reduced into fiction especially the women, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, quite quite right. Let's go to some of the real people then that you have 
um, written about. So let's start with Maxwell Knight um, Henry. You've written a book on him, uh, M, it's called, Maxwell Knight, MO5's Greatest Spy Master. Could you tell us who he was? Yeah, <clears throat> he was a, an animal lover, and he was someone who was really good at reading people. Those are two abiding qualities. He was also a jazz musician, he loved jazz. But he's also someone who, um, it's relevant to what we're talking about, who loves spy thrillers. Right. And there's a really lovely moment where one of his spies, someone who reported to him something like 22 years, quite early on, noticed that all of the meetings he'd have with Maxwell Knight would take place in places like the sort of the back row of a CD cinema in Leicester Square or sort of the foyer of a suburban hotel so miles away from where either of them lived. And at one point this agent asked Maxwell Knight, why, um, why are we meeting in these places? And, uh, and he thought for a bit and just said, well, that's what they do in spy thrillers. <laughs> <laughs> And I love that. And he basically, he, he was drawn into espionage by reading these fantastic novels about espionage. And also, and this is more of a sort of historical point about MI5 in the 20s and the 30s, he was someone who was taken on by MI5. He didn't have rigorous training about exactly what to do. So a lot of the time he was taking his tips from stuff he'd read, stuff he'd heard in radio plays or stuff he'd read in, in novels. So he was deeply influenced by the fictional spy world. But he was also someone who was obsessed with animals and always had a, a house full of the most exotic collection of, of pets, from small bears to mongoose to bats, mice, cats, the works. And his skill was basically keeping them alive. He could always tell what the different animals needed at different times. And I, one of the things I talk about in the book is that this is a skill that's sort of translated in some ways to the business of agent running where right. he'd have all sorts of different agents, all with different temperaments and characters, all needed different things from him as an agent runner. And he was able to keep some of them going for, for incredibly long periods. So he was a fascinating man. He was difficult, he was complex, <coughs> he was full of paradoxes. He definitely made a lot of mistakes, but he was very good at running spies. That's interesting, that, so that nurturing aspect carried through from animals to people. Yeah, and I think, I mean, touching on sort of one of your earlier questions, that's the thing that's drawn me to the world of spies and espionage. It's that relationship between the agent runner and the agent themselves. Because it's really unusual. It's not like lovers. It's not like friends. It's not like family. But it has an element of all three. And I think that's something that really has fascinated me. What, what was his impact? His impact was he played a huge part in the death of British fascism. That's one of the kind of headline claims. And he was someone who, early on in his career, was told to infiltrate the British fascisti. So this is back in the 1920s. Now, some people think he went too far, as in he infiltrated to such an extent that he was basically, he'd become a British fascist himself. Right. He would always maintain, I was just, I was at deep cover. And it was interesting in the book, trying to work out to what extent his sympathies turned. And it's a really interesting question. If you spend a long time in an extremist organization, and you're parroting out some of the views, you're going through the motions of being that person, you know, to what extent do you, when does the line between the character you're playing and, and the reality of who you are, when does that line basically disappear? Anyway, his infiltration early on allowed him during the Second World War to make the case for all the leading British fascists in Britain to be locked up. And he made a persuasive point, which Churchill then acted upon, and as a result, they were interned. And without that, there's a very good chance that they would not have been. And that really changed the course of, the, of Oswald Mosley's uh, BUF. And, uh, yeah, that's one of his big legacies. What was it like to go through the archival material, though, relating to... It Maxwell? was completely thrilling. It was one of the most exciting things historically I've done because I think this is something that, from a historical point of view, makes espionage a really interesting, exciting subject. More stuff keeps getting released. Mm -hmm. And suddenly when I was writing this book, there was suddenly a load of new material about Maxwell Knight that came out. And it allowed me to try and work out the identities of his agents, because they were referred to just by codes in the archival papers. But I was able to cross-reference that with other material and then find out who these people really were. And that completely transformed my understanding of just what was going on, who Maxwell Knight was, and who the agents that he, were run he was running were. 
And is it true that he brought more women into the into intelligence? It is, which is a nice segue into, into Claire's Well, birth. you know, I didn't plan yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He, um, this is one of his big... Um, one of his big shifts, if you like, within MI5. He was the first person to say female spies can often achieve a huge amount more than male spies. And at the time, MI5 officers simply felt the opposite. And he was the one person who went against the grain. And, um, and he changed the character of agent running inside MI5. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to turn to, um, to Claire's, one of Claire's many books, um, The Spy Who Loved. Um, but before I speak to Claire, we are going to do a giveaway. Um, I have a question for you. So The Spy Who Loved is obviously very similar to a Bond film title, The Spy Who Loved Me. Um, can anyone name the actor that played James Bond in that film? Straight up, straight up. We'll just need to get the microphone to you. Roger Moore. Roger Moore. Okay, brilliant. <clears throat> You've won. It's signed as well. Congratulations. <laughs> Um, so, so good. <laughs> so, Christine Granville, she was, if, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, she was the first female agent of the British to serve in the field and the longest serving of all Britain's wartime in the women Second agents World War. in yeah. the Second World War. Um, could you tell me who she was? Yeah, okay. So, uh, she was born Christina Scarbeck. She was a, a Polish countess. She was um, she was a pre-war beauty queen, an expert skier. She got a bit bored of skiing with the guys, so she ended up leaving them all behind. And then she got bored of that and used to smuggle cigarettes across the border. She's one of the few women in the 1930s who didn't actually smoke. Um, she just did it for the thrill, for the kicks of doing it, which is all very useful because she knew the routes in and out under the radar across the mountains. Very useful in the war. Um, but because her mother had been born Jewish, she was never really fully accepted in the higher echelons of Polish society. So she sort of grew up used to having to fight her corner as well. Um, and all of which becomes a very useful package. And she's actually on her second husband by the time, um, September 39, when Nazi Germany invades Poland. Um, and they, he was a diplomat, so they're in um, Africa. But they turned around and came back. Um, and when they came back, her husband, you know, they arrived at Southampton. He said, well, have a few cocktails in, in London, darling. See you after the war's over in a couple of months. And she's like, oh, my gosh, the war might finish before I've you know, got in there. So she is straight up to London. And she obviously had her contacts. Well, we know a bit about that. And she is banging on the supposedly secret door of the British Secret Services. I have to say, she wasn't recruited. We we're talking about recruitment. Um, she sort of volunteered or really demanded to be taken on. And uh, she went for MI6, not MI5, so perhaps that made a difference. But they were all absolutely horrified. They were all young men in there, of course. And they were like, well, there's no way, because to work for the British Secret Services, you do actually have to be British, and she's Polish at this point. Um, and then, your mother's Jewish? Are you insane? You're suicidal? Um, and above all, of course, she's female, and there were no women in this role. Um, and there is an argument that part of the reason that um, SOE, that was only established a year, over a year later, took women was because of her example. But she, she had all the right language skills, she had brilliant contacts, the British were desperate to find out what was happening in the first occupied country of Europe, and of course she knew how to get in and out of the country. Um, so they, they took her on. And there's a brilliant, because she worked directly for the British and she ended her life with her code name as her main name, Christine Granville, as a British citizen. Um, her files are in the British archives. They're obviously all over Poland as well. I did go to those. Um, but she, the first memo in there is by these young men who are still really startled by her. And they say she's um, an expert skier and a great adventuress as well as being absolutely fearless. But what I really loved is one of these guys had written in the margin in pencil and it said, but she terrifies me. <laughs> so I think that gives you a bit of her character. So, yeah. <laughs> We, so we've, sp we've spoken about Christine Granville um, previously and um, podcasts and things. And she is, as you say, she is more Bond than Bond. She does have all these skills. She does, um, she's, she's part of really daring Yeah, she exercises. served in three different theatres of the war. She smuggled intelligence across borders, including microfilm hidden in her leather gloves as she skied across the mountains, which she then got straight to Churchill's desk. Well, I say straight, involved several border crossings at high danger, but anyhow... Um, and this mug film had the potential to change the course of the war. It showed the massing of tanks and troops on what was then the German side of the German-Soviet wartime border. So basically preparations for Operation Barbarossa when Hitler would betray Stalin and force Stalin to join the Allies, which is very useful for us. Um, so, yeah, she got that to Churchill. And at that point, he told his daughter, Sarah Oliver, that, you know, this spy is my favourite spy. So we know in 1941 she was Churchill's favourite spy. 
But all of this is really sort of the preface because the work that makes her legendary is the thea third theatre of the war, which is Nazi-occupied France. That's where she undertook her most daring and, you know, probably most significant. She does so much amazing work. But yeah, there in France, she... Um, managed to secure the defection of an entire Nazi German garrison on a strategic pass in the Alps in anticipation of D-Day in the south on her own, um, and then came down the mountain, found the group of men she was working with had been arrested and was scheduled to be executed, and goes off and rescues them. She's just extraordinary <laughs> on her own, again. Um, and that's, that's not the half of it. So, yeah, she's very, very effective. One of the things that we were um, that was spoken about during our final event yesterday, um, um, there was an event on... Um, Harold Gillies, the plastic surgeon during World mm. War I, was how the theatre of war, because of everything that goes with it, injuries in this case, um, enabled medicine to grow and change and evolved. Do you think the same can be said with espionage and also perhaps opportunities for women and people that may not necessarily have had opportunities otherwise? Well, yes. I mean, as I said, women were specifically employed for their gender. I mean, SOE recruited them mainly to be wireless transmitters, which is incredibly dangerous because you're, the Germans could track the signal. Um, so they were given a six-week six life expectancy before they were parachuted or brought in. Um, or they were expected to be couriers because women, especially after the um, STO, the um, Enforced Labour Service for French young men came in, in France, in occupied France, women could move around the country more easily by bike or truck or hitching or whatever. Um, so women were using those roles. But what you find is that as the men are arrested or, or killed, the women step up and end up leading circuits, leading um, you know, great groups. Pearl Witherington led 2,000 men into battle. I mean, these are not regular opportunities for women. Having said that, um, I've also written books on pilots. You know, obviously we had our ATO here, which is over 160 women were involved, over 1,000 men, so it's proportional. Um, but in, even in Nazi Germany, and you can't get a more machoistic, prejudiced society, um, they employed two women um, in test testing these incredibly expensive pioneering aircraft. And one of them tested, one of the first women to fly a helicopter in the world, she ended up testing a... Uh, a V-1, which is basically, is the buzz bomb or doodlebug. It's a prototype cruise missile. So she is flying one of these things. They're absolutely extraordinary work. Um, so you do actually find women in all sort of areas of the work. And, and British women weren't meant to be in the front line of fire. So <clears throat> the women that joined, that, that were SOE agents, were recruited via the FANI, which is the first aid nursing yeomanry from the First World War. They would ride in on their horses and, and bring men back for field hospitals. But they are uniform, but they're not in the British Armed Forces, so they were allowed to carry to bear weapons. So that's how they kind of got around it. But actually you get women operating searchlights and machine gun nests and things, and effectively they're in the front line of fire. Um, but it's not really talked about so much. So. The, I, I, <clears throat> We shouldn't remember people for the saddest aspects of their life, um, but it is a shame and it is frustrating when you think about what happened to Christine after the war. Yeah. Do you think that she wasn't valued perhaps as highly? Oh, it's absolutely II? appalling at the end of the war. So Christine, should, she should have died very early on, but she survives the entire war. It's absolutely extraordinary. Um, and then she's demobbed. And the last papers in the in queue in the British archives, there's, and I'm, just, I'm quoting, but it is in context, not out of context. It says, she is no longer wanted. <clears throat> and they dismissed her with three months salary, it's £100, which is not nothing. Um, but she didn't have British citizenship, so she was left high and dry in Cairo. She couldn't go back to Poland, country of her birth, because it was now, you know, there's a Soviet-backed communist regime imposed on the country, and they would have killed her. Her brother died in the first year of the peace. Um, so she's just left, completely stranded. And then they want to give her the OBE and the George Medal. Very high honours. And she brilliantly says, well, I, f I refuse to accept them, thank you. I put my life on the line for six years for the British Crown. You want to give me the honours, but you're not giving me citizenship. And she shamed the British government into giving her citizenship. I mean, not, not Britain's finest hour, I have to say. But then she's here and she ends up being a bathroom stewardess on, on passenger liners and, you know, hat check girl and working waitressing. I don't want to give it all away, but she comes to a terrible sticky end, some of you probably know. Um, so, and yes, and I think that's all attributable to this lack of value. But you have to remember, it wasn't just women. You get returning generals coming back from the war who end up painting walls. And, you know, there mm. is this demobilisation cause, this massive social um, upheaval. And, you know, there's a massive spike in violent crime. And that, that whole context, it was at such an appalling moment. But, yes, yeah, she is a victim of that. And it's quite a consistent thing in the, the stories of, of real spies that... Um, it, they don't always end well, yeah. these stories. And, um, and certainly with Maxwell Knight, 
it was uh, one of the amazing things about identifying, working out who his different agents were, was I was able then to see what happened to them when they stopped reporting to MI5 and just went back to their ordinary lives. And nine times out of 10, there was a really tragic end to their life as and they would die much younger than expected. I found, this, I found the death certificates of all of, the, all of his main agents. And for example, this disproportionate number of them had um, type two diabetes related to, or they had alcoholism, or they had something stress related. And I found that tragic, but also the fact that they were never recognized for what they did. And obviously the one thing you don't do as a spy is then, if you're working about MI5, is, is talk about it and hope that you're celebrated. But there could have been some kind of secret recognition. There could be some kind of acknowledgement of that, uh, that sacrifice. But no, it's something which, um, which, which I think we find in, in so many spy stories, this, uh, this sad ending. Yeah, and uh, just to, anecdotally, I, I, I do true, a lot of true crime. And what I find with people that working in the police forces in, say, the 1970s and 1980s, there are lots of similar health issues, that level mm. of stress. Yeah. Um, but let's turn, let's turn to um, what happens when somebody is on the other end of things, when they're being investigated. Um, and this is another segue. Um, we'll turn to Churchill's Iceman. Could you, could you tell me about Geoffrey Pike? Geoffrey Pike was an eccentric, he was a genius, he was a difficult man. He was, um, he was brilliant and often unhappy. And, uh, and I wrote a biography of him, Churchill's Iceman, and his, the, the thing that he, the period of his life when he was most productive was during the Second World War, and he was taken on by Lord Mountbatten. And he was part of this mini brains trust. It was him and two other brilliant scientists. And their job was just to come up with radical, new ideas that nobody else was thinking of. And one of the ideas that he came up with, which Churchill loved, which Mountbatten loved, an enormous prototype was built, was, wait for it, an aircraft carrier built out of ice. <laughs> Sensible. <laughs> which, when I first read about it, I thought, that's bananas. Um, but it turns out that water with wood pulp mixed into it, which is then frozen, creates this new material, which they named pikrete after Jeffrey Pike, which has the tensile strength of reinforced concrete. I hope I got that right. And, um, but also, once uh, you have the wood pulp mixed in, the ice doesn't melt as fast. So it would have worked. You would have been able to build relatively cheap, very hard to sink aircraft carriers made out of, of ice, but in also enormous, so you could land bombers on them in the way that you couldn't with an ordinary aircraft carrier at that time. So that was one of his ideas. He's also the father of the US and Canadian Special Forces. So he came up with the notion of the US Special Forces, um, a unit being airdropped behind enemy lines and existing for a long time in occupied enemy territory. And he wanted them to do kind of, to be slightly more counterintuitive than ordinary soldiers. That was his big thing. He's a deeply counterintuitive man, but, and this takes us to your question. He was also someone who caught the attention of MI5, who thought he was working for the Soviets as an agent. And I wrote the proposal for this book back in, I think it was 2012. And I had it all good to go. It was about 20,000 words. I had this sort of chapter structure lined up. And I think it was the day before I was going to send it, MI5 released this mass of new material. <laughs> At least it was the day Mixed before. Spicy. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Including three files on Jeffrey Pike, suspected Soviet spy. So I suddenly had to rewrite the whole proposal and factor in the idea that he could have been working for the Soviets. I'll leave it for the book as to whether or not he was, but it suddenly becomes a really interesting part of his life. He starts to be shadowed around London by MI5 watchers. And he certainly had close connections to known Soviet agents. But a huge part of this, and I think this takes us to a broader point, is that he was unusual. He was deeply, deeply unusual. He was also Jewish. And these are things that factored into the suspicion on the part of MI5, who, and there are parts of, of MI5 that were anti-Semitic at that time. And sometimes the person who's accused of being a spy is similar to the person who is accused of being a witch, the person who is seen as the outsider, no one can quite figure out. Maybe they're a spy. There's something about this person we're not quite sure about. And that played a big part in Jeffrey Pike's life throughout. 
So that's so interesting. I'm, I'm going to turn, um, we've touched on it a little bit already, but I'm going to turn to your research processes. I'm gonna, also going to put a big picture up of the books that are coming out. There we go. We have them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to your research processes. Claire, with your, with your latest book, Agent Zoe, you return to Polish history, a Polish yeah. figure. What was, what was the draw for you with this particular person and how did you access the archive material to bring her story to life? Oh, well, she's just, she seduced me completely. She's fantastic. So when I had done my book on Christina, um, Polish Embassy is slightly embarrassing. Well, it's not embarrassing. I'm very proud of it. The Polish Embassy kindly gave me a cultural honour. I've got a medal. Amazing. So, no, no, no. Um, but anyhow, it is brilliant. I wear it in bed, you know. I'm very proud. Um, anyhow, so I was at, the, at an event at the Polish Embassy and there were lots of people and it was all very nice. And there was one quite short, short woman at the back who was very elderly. So I came up to chat to her. I do, you know, like that. Uh, and she said, well, I just don't understand why you wrote about her. Why didn't you write about Zoe? I'm like, hmm, who's Zoe? And it turned out this woman was a veteran of the Warsaw Uprising. She was incredibly brave as a teenager. She'd run through an incendiary bombing raid with, you know, glass bottles full of methylated spirits for them to use in their field hospitals and realised halfway through that she was actually, you know, petrol bomb herself in that state. And, you know, she was just amazing. And I thought, well, she's, you know, if she rated Zoe, I'd better find out who she is. So that's how I came across her. Um, and the research, so I have returned to Polish history uh, in my fourth book, so two out of four. Um, and it's partly because I think when we tend to think of women in the resistance, we tend to look west. We tend to think about the women who served in France. And there is fantastic history there and great stories of courage and tragedy and achievement. Um, but I think we're much less good at looking the other way. And I think this history is increasingly, it feels very resonant at the moment. In fact, I was writing about Zoe making uh, petrol bombs in the basement of a girls' school in Lvov very early on in the war in um, October 1939 and against the encroaching uh, Soviet forces as they were then. And as I was writing about it, Radio 4, exactly the same thing. There were women being interviewed who were making petrol bombs and I was thinking, oh gosh, we really need to look at our history from different perspectives. So that's partly why. The archives, it's, it, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. I uh, went out, there's not so much on her in Britain, there's a little bit, because she spent quite a bit of the war in Britain, which is why it's such a great holistic story for us as well. In fact, she's the only woman to parachute to occupied Poland from Britain. The only um, Polish spy or special agent to parachute in a dress, because she's the only woman, she's in a, oh, wow. a blue van silk dress. I was like, okay, <laughs> great. But <laughs> under her drop suit and everything. Um, but, yeah, so she... So I went out to Poland and I had an incredible couple of weeks between lockdowns going around with a, a fantastic Bogdan Polish translator who came with me. The stuff I found it was amazing. At one point I was interviewing um, uh, Lech Wałęsa's press secretary who'd worked with him through Solidarity and he had been a journalist who had interviewed Zoe. So um, that was fantastic. It's like Alistair Campbell, basically, but Polish. So he's quite a confident chap and uh, the press were there and I knew they weren't for me, they were for him, it was quite amazing. Anyhow, so we sat there and he gave me about an hour or two and I thought, well, that's probably all I'm going to get. So I was trying to pack it in. And then he said, would you like to hear her voice? I was like, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And he pulled out this plastic bag and he put a tape deck and it still had this very old solidarity sticker on the front. And he put in a tape and, and there she was, you know, banging on the table and crying at one point, very emotional, and this lovely soft Pomeranian accent. It was amazing. And then the tape stopped, it was clunky click, and this martial music blared out. And uh, we are in the World War II Museum, and everyone was, like, looking around. I was like, oh, gosh. So I said, excuse me, can I ask, what's that doing there? And he said, well, when I recorded her, it was before Poland had its freedom. And, um, and it was illegal for him as a journalist to have a tape deck that recorded or tapes that you could record on. <coughs> and he found the best ones to put the sellotape over the tab were the ones of the state. So he had literally recorded the testimony of a freedom fighter over the propaganda of the communist regime in mm. Poland. It was just like, it's fantastic. So it's not my preface, but it should be. I've just got so many stories. But anyhow. That's amazing. So, obviously, I mean, she's in lots of... The, and she also kept her own archive after the war. She, she realised that no one was keeping any records of any of the women who served. And it's kind of a bit of a group biography because she served with about three women incredibly closely, one of whom was doing sabotage. And, you know, they're all doing different stuff. Um, and so she had kind of kept all these documents and had to keep them hidden in her communist flat for about 40 years. She was repeatedly arrested, 
tortured at one point, but anyhow, yeah, just extraordinary. So the only reason we know about the women who served in the resistance in Poland, which was the highest, you know, the Polish Home Army, the Polish Resistance Army, um, was the biggest resistance force in occupied Europe, and it had about at least 50,000 women serving in it, so it's the biggest female force as well. Um, the only reason we have a lot of these stories is because she secretly kept this archive. So, I mean, there's so much material everywhere. Could you tell us a little bit about her role in the Warsaw Uprising? Yes, so, um, so she started the war in uniform, uh, making petrol bombs in Lviv. Um, and then they got out. Um, Poland started the war, you know, Nazi Germany comes in on the west, and Poland actually put up a better defence than we normally sort of remember, I think. But when the Soviets invaded 17 days later from the east, they knew they couldn't fight successfully on two fronts. And so, very wisely, they decided to get their government, their treasury, the first Enigma code breakers, and 35,000 troops out through Lviv. That's what she's doing. They're keeping the route open. Um, they went into France. They regrouped, fought with the Allies, fought in the Battle of France, eventually end up in Scotland. And they decided to cream off. These are the soldiers that got more experience of service than anyone in the war at this point on the Allied side. So they cream off the top 2,000. They select 800 of them. And they put them into special forces training for this group called the Chico Chemni, the silent and unseen. It's so romantic sounding, but anyhow. And um, a very rigorous training, nearly 600 passed the training. From those, they've only got enough aircraft and, you know, clear moonless lights for 316 to be parachuted back behind enemy lines into France, Romania, mostly into Poland, other countries too. And of them, there's just one woman, and that, of course, is Zoe. So she's the only woman to parachute back. She's already done three years of service at this point, so it didn't really phase her. Um, she's parachuted back uh, into a Poland where the Gestapo are actively hunting for her. They've got her name, her face. Her entire family has been arrested. Some of them survive. Um, put into camps and prisons. And then she takes part in the largest act of organised defiance against Nazi Germany in the Second World War, which is the Warsaw Uprising, where she plays a key role um, in, in that. And it's an extraordinary story. I find it really moving even now. Um, and amazingly, she should have, just like Christina, she should have died early on, but she survived, like Christina, the entire war and didn't have a sad ending, <laughs> I'm glad to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But did have a truly incredible life. But because she survived, I mean, I, she ended up being arrested by the communist regime, tortured, and then they hid her story for over 40 years. But among the people I interviewed was her cellmate, who was younger than her, and lots of people who worked with her afterwards. So it was really extraordinary. Died just two weeks shy of her centenary and never stopped fighting all the way through. She's just brilliant. But that bit at the end is a bit faster. It's mostly Second World War. But, yeah. Incredible. Pre-order, pre-order. <laughs> um, we're going to move forward in time now to... <clears throat> actually, I don't need to change the slide because you can see it there already. Um, Four Shots in the Night, a true story of spies, murder and justice in Northern Ireland. But before I speak to you, Henry, we are going to do another giveaway. <laughs> the question this time, in honour of your previous book, is during Daniel Craig's tenure as... James Bond, who was, who played M? I need a hand up, I need a hand up. Okay, okay, the lady there. She said Judy Dench and she is correct. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> there's, a, there's a special thing about this book actually. It, Henry signed it previously, but it also has his fingerprint in ink. Yeah. So, his, his yes. pen leaked. <laughs> Not intentional. <laughs> well. <laughs> um, we've, we've spoken about um, early and mid 20th century espionage. Yes. Um, how different or similar was it for you accessing and looking at the archive when you were studying a case that happened in the 1980s? I mean, are the, are the yeah. same patterns there? or It's really, I mean, it's, it's similar and it's different. The, I'm going to start with the, the, with the differences. There's a lot less archive material because we need to wait longer for more stuff to, to come out. And there are many, many more interviews with people who remembered the events that I'm writing about. So this book is the story of a, of a murder, the murder of a, of a spy. And the allegation that began to, to surface soon after this man was killed is that he was killed by another British spy who was also inside the IRA. And... The reason I was even looking into this as a, as a story, as a subject, is it all came from one conversation I had with someone who said, you do realize the biggest story 
in the last 70 years of British intelligence history is that of spies inside the IRA, and that the reason the troubles came to an end was that the IRA was so riddled with spies from the police, from MI5, from the army, that they had almost no option other than to look for peace. And that intrigued me. That was something I was skeptical of. That's something I wanted to investigate. And this one particular murder, that of a man called Frank Hegarty, was a story that seemed to encapsulate so much of this, partly because the man who was accused of killing him was an agent codenamed State Knife, who's been in the news quite a lot recently. So it was extraordinary beginning to, to speak to people who had memories, really vivid memories of some of the things that had happened, but also being an outsider. So being able to speak to people from the intelligence community, from the police, from the army and other agencies, but also people who've been in the IRA, people who've been in other paramilitary organizations, or people who've been close to those, and also people who just knew the victim from Derry. And this, I mean, one of the things I found most interesting about this, it took me back to why I wanted to write history in the first place. I still remember, aged about 16, the first time I read E.H. Carr's What is History? And the whole notion that as a historian, there's a huge part of you that comes into the history you write. And it's really your business to, to try and understand that, to try and unpack it. And almost all of the conversations I had for this book, for Four Shots in the Night, they would kind of begin with, with the person I was speaking to basically saying, where are you coming from? What's your angle? And I'm so used to writing about Second World War stories. No one asks, so you're on the side of the Nazis or the... <laughs> yeah. And suddenly, here was a different story that was so much more complex. So I had to, to think much harder about exactly where I was coming from, what I was bringing to the story. And it involved a lot more just finding people who didn't always want to be found and trying to earn their trust enough to speak to them off the record. So there's a, very, there's a much more human element to the research than, than for any other book I've done. Well, that was going to be my question for you. Obviously, you, you're writing about an incident that happened during the Troubles, which is a very sensitive um, time in history, but it's, it's history, but it's also present. Lots of the events that happen still bleed into the world that we live in today. Were there any other challenges for you in writing such a recent history? Yeah, and certainly challenges in terms of what can be told, what needs to be told. But I think I realized very early on that if there's one really consistent theme from the Troubles, it is that too much has been covered up. There has been too much secrecy. And even this story of just of spies inside the IRA has barely been told. And when I tell you about the scale of it, you, will, you won't believe me, I promise. <laughs> it's, uh, try, try. <laughs> there was um, an interview that happened in 2016 with someone called Father Dennis Bradley, who's part of the consultative group in the past. And he'd been allowed to see classified government documents that revealed how many agents are being run in the greater Belfast area at any one time in the 1990s. And he went on the record as saying it was 800 agents, 800 agents. And that I found amazing in itself. The reaction from an MI5 professional who was asked about this number was even more interesting. And he said that was an underestimate. Gosh. So you've got this situation. The adult population of Northern Ireland at that time is about 1 million. And you've got as many as 1,000 agents, let's say, operating in that, that place. Each of those agents has a handler. They have support staff. There are also people engaged in, um, in surveillance operations who, of course, are not involved in agent running. You've got several thousand people operating one of the largest... <laughs> intelligence penetrations of a paramilitary organization ever. And I find that really intriguing that that story is only beginning to be told now. Part of it, I think, is to do with the psychology of what happens after a really, a really difficult civil war, such as what you had in Northern Ireland. Of course, technically, it was never a war, but I think you can more or less refer to it as that. And so often, when you look through the history of conflicts like that, so often in the first 5, 10, 20 years, no one wants to really look at the past. But it's soon after that that, that the historians come in. And then you can begin to try and unpack what happened. And so I found it exciting writing something that, that parts of this hadn't been told before. And, I, and hopefully there's a need for it to be told. That's, that's what drew me in. 
But the added layer to this as well is that it's not just, you're, you're not just writing about events in 1986. From 2016 onwards, this was a live investigation. Exactly. Did that, I mean, that must have been difficult in terms of a, being a historian. Yeah, you know, knowing it what was. You can I, I was in say. uncharted territory. Suddenly, um, I was being a sort of true crime writer as much as a historian. And, yeah, so there was um, an enormous police investigation, 72 detectives. They had access to thousands of classified government documents, and they had one job, and that was to find out whether or not State Knife had committed any crimes. And State Knife, when they began, had been accused of up to 50 murders. 50, which is an extraordinary figure. So there's this enormous investigation going on at the same time as I'm doing my own tiny investigation. <laughs> One investigation has £40 million worth of resources and significantly more <laughs> access than me. And the strangest thing was there came a time when I got a call from the police investigation. And I'd been kind of writing to them saying, like, please, 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 can you tell me everything about your investigation? And unsurprisingly, they were saying no. <laughs> Finally, I got the call, and I thought, brilliant. They're going to um, tell me everything. <laughs> and I still remember being um, arranging to meet at this particular bar thinking that's a strange place. Going into this, this bar, which turns out was, um, was closed, and being shown up to a space upstairs. I just had one person who said he was going to speak to me, and suddenly there were two, and they had a recording device, and there was one table in the enormous empty dance floor, and I was shown to a seat. And I remember timidly getting out my phone saying, um, can I record this? <laughs> nope. <laughs> And they had heard that I knew something which they had not been able to find out. And they wanted to know the source for what I'd found. And the reason I'm telling you this is that it's an example of times when, as a historian, there are places you can get to that a police investigation actually cannot. And I found that really interesting. But the other reason I'm telling you this is that you also learn you have to protect your source. And the source of this information told me this is off the record, so I had to tell them this is off the record which led to an uncomfortable conversation, but um, that's the world that I was operating in when researching this, this story. So, yeah, it was all uncharted territory for me, but um, it's very live. That's, that's what, uh, legally, I'm, I'm really curious to know, are you, are you allowed to protect your sources in that way? Absolutely, if it, right. yeah. yeah. And what was so interesting was actually both of these detectives, after about four minutes of being really cross, suddenly went, oh, okay. Right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bad cop, nice bad chat. done. Yeah. I'm yeah. really glad. Well done. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Appalling situation. It was, yeah, but I, I respected where they were coming from and mm. they understood why I couldn't mm. say anything more. Have, so. have you ever felt any heat from the research that you're doing? Obviously, it's further back. In very different ways. Um, totally different ways, but a whole variety. In my first book, Eglantine Jeb, the um, founder of Save the Children, um, I visited the family, I stayed in a pub and went to see them, and they had this huge archive, it's absolutely incredible. Um, and then I didn't have time to go through it all, there were ten huge boxes. This is the family part, part of the family archive that relates to Eglinton. I was like, oh my goodness, that was my first book, I had no idea. And the second time I came back, they said, oh, you know, we got on, you don't want to stay in the house, it was great, and they put me in her bedroom, marvellous. And the next morning, this file appeared, sort of out of the ether, and it was full of love letters, and it was this secret love story that had finally said, OK, we trust you, you can tell it, but until you built that relationship, you know, because she was gay, and it was a love affair with John Maynard Keynes, the economist's younger sister. And so that's a different sort of, you know, that had never come out previously, and that, that's a different way of building trust. But, um, yeah, I've had all sorts of strange encounters, but not that immediate. So when I was researching Christina, I met a guy... He was also researching her, but for an academic paper. And he, he clicked his heels and said, um, hello, I'm a communist spy. I had to go, oh, hello. I'm a mother of three from Saffron Malden. Very nice to meet you. What you say? Um, and it was quite interesting what he was prepared to share and what he wasn't. So that was uh, my, my closest induction to that, I suppose. I was also nearly arrested by the Gestapo in Warsaw. OK, we need to know about this. So. <laughs> well, this was, this was slightly different. I was... Um, researching Christina again, and um, I was lucky enough because I'd interviewed the son of a count who was one of her lovers whose life she'd saved, in, in a story that's in the book. Can't do it all now. Anyhow, he said, oh, well, if you're going to Warsaw, do you want to stay in my flat? And I just thought, well, how often is a Polish count going to lend me their flat? So I said, yes. He gave me the key. He wasn't staying as well. My translator stayed around the corner with his aunt. And in the morning, I came out, and, um, and there was actually a Wehrmacht unit in the street. So I just thought, hang on. So I shut the door, and I thought, don't be ridiculous. So I came out. And they were still there, and now they were quite angry. And um, some guy got off his 
he was on a, um, a motorbike and he came running towards me with, it was a handheld machine gun and it had a sort of perforated barrel that he started jabbing towards my neck. Oh and my I, I was in tears. It was the most scary thing that I'd encountered. And then my friend Machet came running around the corner saying, oh, I'm so sorry, Claire, we got here late. And I didn't see, there's a poster on the side. It says, please don't come out between 8 and 10 because we're filming for World War II TV series. <laughs> <laughs> but in a sense, even that taught me something because, you know, I guess I had known it must be something like that, but my brain just hadn't had time to catch up. Whereas Christina was arrested more than once in Nazi-occupied Poland during the war and they considered her Jewish and she was a British special agent and she would have been, well, she was actually taken away to be interrogated very roughly on one occasion um, and managed to talk her way out of it, um, incredibly. But she didn't lose her call, what she did. So when she was arrested, she didn't sit down and nearly cry like me. Um, she actually, she was taken away and arrested and she, she, she was quite ill at the time. She had a hacking cough and a fever and she decided to make a virtue of her apparent weakness, which was her ill health. And she, she bit her own tongue and, and not a little, but hard and repeatedly until when she coughed, it looked as if she was coughing up blood, which is the symptoms of TB, tuberculosis. Um, and there was no cure in early 41 and TB, you know, it's carried by waterborne droplets. So basically interrogation and TB don't mix and they threw her out. And um, it's just incredible. And later that went into the SOE sort of tips guide for future <laughs> agents. But what they said is, bite your tongue or your gums. And I've been trying to work out how you could bite your own gums. I don't think you can do that. But, um, no. but what I mean is it really brought home to me her blunt courage and her quick thinking because, you know, I was completely bamboozled by this. But that's when her blood went up and she really stepped into action. That's when she did her best work is when the threat was greatest. So, yeah. But it brought that home to me, so. Goodness me, that's a, a cracking ane anecdote, Claire. I mean, Good. <laughs> that's great. Um, I, we will turn to audience questions in a moment. I just have one final question to ask of, of both of you, and it's to do with the archive. Obviously, you're, you're piecing together lives of people that are, their stories are designed to not, to not to be known. To not be known? Anyway, to be secret, to be up to secret. Um, how, do, how do you do that? I'll start with you, Claire. Well, I mean, luckily, there's lots of archival stuff now. Um, Christina Scarbeck, I wanted more, so I applied under the Freedom of Information Act, and 50 years have passed, so you can get a certain amount, and most of it wasn't redacted, a couple of little tiny bits were, which is interesting. Um, so there's that. But I think there's, you know, there's other ways like following. Antonia Fraser calls it optical research, which I like as a term, but it means going on holiday to the places where they were and seeing what you can find. <laughs> but you can find a lot, actually, if you look from their perspective. If you go to the parish archive, there's actually a baptism certificate or whatever. Um, so there's that and interviews. And I, I, I love all of it, but I particularly love the interviews with veterans or the witnesses. And, of course, I had to say it, you know, as the... As the human coast arose, there is less opportunity for that, but also you get people finding stuff in the attics that haven't, you know, that suddenly start coming out. So there's, there's th those sort of different sources. Um, and it is, it is, like you say, I mean, they were taught to cover their tracks and not to leave a paper trail. And um, Christina certainly liked to tell a good story. So after the war, she would tell stories to lots of adoring men in various bars. Um, and so I researched all those. And, you know, like she said, that when she was parachuted into France, there was a storm that night. And I, I did check. Weather reporters are very efficient. And there was a storm in that part of France. So I was like, OK, good. And she said, I, I was swept off course. And as I came through the clouds, I was nearly you know, pushed, pierced through the heart by the spire of a church. But I managed to steer my parachute and avoid getting my head knocked out by the gravestones. And I thought, wow, you know, cracking. But her own report she sent back, which I got under the Freedom of Information Act, um, said landed in field as expected. That was it. <laughs> so um, you do have to do your double checking and, uh, you know, triangulate with your weather reporters and everyone else. Yeah. And Henry? Yeah, I mean, very, very, very similar. It's um, you go to the archives, you go to the family members and you do as much research as possible. I mean, in some ways, I find it's, it's the part that comes after that that's more challenging, more difficult. In other words, what to leave out. Mm. Yeah and how to shape the story, how to make sure the characters that you're writing about are ones that have, I hate to use the kind of Hollywood term, but to, that have arcs that go on, on journeys, that you have something, you, you get a better understanding of, of them. And, and yeah, I find the, the research part is the kind of the, the easy bit, and uh, it's what happens afterwards, which is, uh, which is more, more complex and challenging. Well, on that note, um, do we have any audience questions? I can see a, if you could just wait for the microphone to come to you, but there's a gentleman at the front there. Hi. Uh, 
Um, did you, when you're doing your work on Northern Ireland, did you ever have to say, I'd better not say this because it could lead to a breakdown in the, in the shared partnership. DUP might accuse somebody who's very senior now in Sinn Féin was actually in the IRA. And that would cause real problems. Have you ever had to face those queries? I think I'll just leave that because it's too dangerous. So, yes and no. There are, de there are definitely times. So, books I've written in the past, like the one about Maxwell Knight, I was really interested in the identities of agents. And with this book, the Northern Ireland book, I began to, at times, think, oh, I wonder if I can work out who the source for this particular information is. But I very quickly realised that actually identifying agents in this context would be a mistake. And so I think, yes, I, I steered away from doing that, whereas historically, that's what I've always done. But I guess, would it have a political impact? The thing that, that sort of, if I was just to characterize the history of people talking about spies inside the IRA over the last, say, 30 years, the, the fantasy has been even more extraordinary than the reality. And people have suggested that the British were controlling the IRA, that every senior figure in the IRA was actually a, an MI5 spy. That's, in other words, there's so much wild speculation out there that most of the time the truth, even though it sounds extraordinary still, is, more, is, is less shocking. So people, I think, are inured to the shock of finding out that someone inside either Sinn Féin or the IRA could have been working for the British because there's been so many extraordinary stories swirling around in the last 20 years. Um, can we go to an online question next, please? Um, yeah, we've just got one here from Richard, who um, has a question for Henry. Is it true that Maxwell Knight helped William Joyce, a.k.a. Lord Haw Haw, flee to Germany? Yes. <laughs> the short answer. Um, he tipped William Joyce off. William Joyce, a.k.a. Lord Haw Haw. Um, he tipped him off that MI5 were going to come and... Uh, well, the police were going to come and arrest him the following day. And... Um, and this is, in the story of Maxwell Knight, this is the strangest relationship. It's him and William Joyce, and they meet in the mid-1920s. And William Joyce goes off with Maxwell Knight's girlfriend, and Maxwell Knight then writes a book in which the main character is basically William Joyce. There's this kind of strange, I don't want to call it infatuation, but they have a very intense relationship. And I think there are parts of William Joyce that Maxwell Knight wishes he had in himself, and vice versa. And there comes this extraordinary moment in 1939 where Maxwell Knight is told, in his capacity as an MI5 officer, that William Joyce is going to be arrested. And then he calls up Joyce. And I saw the evidence for this, and it's um, a staggering moment. And without that, Joyce would not have been able to go to Germany, would not have become Lord Haw Haw. His story would have been very, very different. And in so many ways, that's what Maxwell Knight then has to try and get redemption for. That's his his big, big mistake. And in what happens in the months that follow, he does try to make amends. Do we have any more questions? Is there a lady at the front there with glasses on your head? <laughs> Just wondering, um, Henry, if you came across information about uh, um, Maxwell Knight, uh, knowing David Cornwell, or communications between them? Yes. So David Cornwell, a.k.a. John le Carre. And John le Carre, or David, what should we call him? Let's call him John le Carre. He, um, he worked for Maxwell Knight in MI5 during his, um, his time in MI5 before he went over to MI6. And John le Carre even illustrated some of Maxwell Knight's books. So Maxwell Knight wrote books about, uh, about natural history, about how to look after pets and animals. And it was extraordinary seeing these illustrations that were sort of signed David Cornwall. And there's a figure in A Perfect Spy called Jack Brotherhood, who is basically <coughs> Maxwell Knight. And I found it so helpful when I was writing um, to get a sense of how John le Carre saw this figure. This, um, this, and it, just brilliant the way he described him. I remember there's a very kind of humble moment after I'd written this book and spent three years writing about Maxwell Knight, trying to get to the essence of him, and then reading something that John le Carre wrote shortly after about Maxwell Knight. And he basically, in a paragraph, <laughs> got to the essence of this man in a way that I was struggling to in 350 pages. <laughs> so he, um, yeah, he, he knew Maxwell Knight extremely well and wrote about him beautifully. 
any other questions from inside the room? Over there? Uh, so I was just wondering, if post-World War II, how did British spying change? And also, did the role of women lessen post-war? Yes, the role of women lessened. Um, so after, after the Second World War, um, SOE was effectively shut down. So the American equivalent, which was initially you know, based on the SOE model, was the OSS, and that eventually evolved into the CIA. But in Britain... Um, Labour government came in, and one of the things they did was shut down SOE, and so that's it's all evolved differently through MI5 and MI6. Um, so, yes, it, it, the, the spying changed quite a lot, and the role of women completely evaporated, so there were no longer female special agents. I mean, there are now, and there have been in between, but that was completely over, and, and it wasn't really discussed for a long time, and it's only in the... Well, in the 50s, you get the first two films, which is Odette and Carve Her Name With Pride, which are very romanticised versions. I mean, I love Carve Her Name With Pride, um, but it's, you know, it's a fictitious account of this. Um, and people, you know, people were incredibly shocked that women had played this role. And, and in a number of ways, they had tried to keep the role of women silent for a long time. For example, women didn't earn their parachute wings, even if they'd done the requisite number of drops. In fact, women were required to do one more drop in training, which they weren't given, so that it wouldn't be uh, mentioned publicly. Um, so you get all of this way, and then they come back, and there's no um, trauma counselling. There's none, none of that. There's no sort of reorientation. Um, and Christina Scarbeck particularly was affected because she was Polish-born, but also because she was part Jewish. And once you get the, the, um, hotel, the Camp David Hotel bombing, anyone that the British consider perhaps their uh, interests are conflicted, you know, they are completely off the books as well. So there is a massive shift after the war, yeah. Can I just follow on from that? Just a, a question about, about your two books, um, Christine and Agent So. Were there any similarities or differences within, within their stories? Yeah, their, their stories are completely different. Their characters are totally different. So um, Christina is... Um, I mean, this is not one of her key achievements, but she is making love to the cream of the Polish, French and British special forces as she's fighting off the Nazi advance, in effect. You know, it's, she has a very... The book's called The Spy Who Loved because she's a very passionate woman. She loves um, adrenaline and adventure. She loves men. She has two husbands, many lovers. But most of all, she loves freedom, both for the country of her birth, her adopted country, which is Britain, but also for herself personally in every way. Um, Zoe also loves freedom, but she, she doesn't love men, thank you very much. Um, there, there isn't a love story in that sense, but there is, there is, there is a lot of love in this book. There are other stories. Um, and Zoe, you know, Christina, she's very charismatic in that way, whereas Zoe is very charismatic, particularly for women. But she, she talks about her friends later, and she's very commanding, and she accepts no hostages. And she gets everyone, she's like a, a galleon in full sail, and they're kind of swept up in her wake, and just like, wow, she's amazing, I'm going to do this, and feel inspired by her in a very different sense. And she, even after the war, she's still writing to everyone, demanding they do stuff, and signing herself Zoe, you know, got, got that. And some of her friends start writing, you know, were we friends, or, you know... Maybe I was just useful to her in some way, but they still adore her, but she's still sort of seen her. And yet they give each other warnings. She's wearing her general shoes, you know, watch out sort of thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they're very different characters, but their stories are very different as well because Christina is working directly for the Brits in, in, in France and elsewhere, whereas Zoe um, is a resistance fighter. She is, she's a member of the Chico Chemney, the Silent Unseen, the only female member. She's a courier. She runs an intelligence network. And she's a resistance fighter fighting in the Warsaw Uprising. So it's a, it's a really very different story. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, do it they did. Sorry. Oh, sorry. But there are a couple of overlaps that I came across. So at one point, Zoe wrote, um, she wrote a lot of letters. Great. And in one of them, she says, oh, there's another of us polls, Christina Scarbeck. She sounds fantastic. I was like, oh, she's talking about my woman. So that was great. <laughs> um, and when I was doing my research in Poland as well, I... I went first to her drop zone where she landed in a field and then I was driving to Warsaw and we diverted to go to this convent that had hid her in the Second World War. But it's, a, it's still a convent and it's closed to the public. So we're peering through the gates and this lovely little old nun came past with a thermos <laughs> flask and, you know, it was very cute. And she said, oh, what's going on here? And um, my, um, Bogdan, my translator said, oh, this is Claire Mully, she's researching books. She said, no, we know Claire Mully. And I said, 
do you? And she said, oh, she wrote a book about Christina Scarbeck, who went to school here when it was a convent school. Oh. And they'd been in the same rooms in the same convent. So there were these, you know, kept coming up to them, but they didn't actually ever meet. So, yes. Yeah. That's, that's so interesting. It's nice, though, to have those connections, I think. Um, do we have any other questions from the room? We'll go to question online then, please. Two really good ones from online. Um, there's about an hour's long debate in the answer to this one. So, um, <laughs> from Radney, um, how can you be certain that these historical figures would want their stories to be known and whether you're actually honouring their wishes or not? Good question. Yeah. I can, um, I can be certain. I'm, I'm not certain. I'm not certain at all. And <laughs> should these stories be told? I think it's, um, that's a really, yeah, really important question. I mean, I think... The book is the answer. I think they should be told, otherwise I wouldn't be, be writing it. But why? Why should they be told? In the case of, of Northern Ireland, maybe in the case of the spies working with Maxwell Knight as well, I think understanding more about what spies sacrifice, what they give, what they do, and what it's like, and also the impact of intelligence on the course of human history. I think if we don't write about these things and we don't understand these things, and I think it's a sometimes neglected element of history. So yes, I do think it's important that there are people writing about these stories. Yeah, I mean, no, of course we don't know because we can't chat to them. Um, and, you know, I'd often like to go back, and, and, but I don't want to meet them. I want to be the fly on the wall. I want to observe them on first hand, but I don't really want to have that chat because it could be quite awkward. Um, so, yes, but I think it's, it's, well, obviously I've written the books too. I think it's really important. Um, with all my books, I've tried to do subjects that I think need to be brought to light. So sometimes it's about restoring the place of women in the history of conflict, um, which is now increasingly being told. But even after my Christina book came out, um, uh, there was a compilation book done by some quite famous authors, and they did a chapter on different people, and one of them was Christine, and the opening line was, and we were drawn to Christine by her beautiful smile. I was like, oh, okay, that's not really, mm. you know. So I think it's about um, letting people know how effective, you know, I think when we think about women in the resistance, we tend to think, oh, beautiful, courageous, right? Sacrifice, absolutely need to remember and honour that. You know, 13 of the agents sent to France alone didn't come back. Um, but I think we're much less good at remembering how effective and what their achievements and contribution was. So I think it's really important to harness these stories to tell that. But I also think, um, you know, geographically it's important to, to, to look to that part of the world. I think it's really important. If we're... When, I, when I've done this book, this is my bestseller, great. Hopefully Zoe will overtake. It will. And, it and will. after that, yeah. my editor said, can you do another female special agent? I thought, well, I've kind of told that story through one particular individual. So I decided to write this book about what was going on inside Nazi Germany, which actually my publisher wasn't so sure about at first. I mean, it's done good, but I wanted to look. I think it's really important. We ask difficult questions like how did Hitler corral the resources of his nation to his criminal ends, you know, including the human resources? How did, how did women fit into that? Especially if you're, you know, one of the amazing things about that is it's such a nuanced story. It's so complicated. But if there's one simple lesson from that book, it's that... It's the absolute hypocrisy of the Nazi regime who said, there's only one place for women, you know, not uh, Kirsche Kuka Kinder, and there's no place at all for people with Jewish heritage, Jewish Germans, um, or Jewish Europeans, and yet gave their highest honours, you know, the Iron Cross, to two women, one of whom had Jewish heritage, um, before she tried to kill Hitler. They, they sort of weren't so keen on her after that. But, um, but yeah, th but they were prepared as long as it met their aims. It's the absolute hypocrisy of that. And I think it's these difficult stories that you really need to be shining a light on. Would they have wanted their stories told? I, I think some of them would be. The, the point is, you can't be anachronistic about it. They lived in their time, and we live in ours. Would Eglantine Jeb want me to out her? Probably not at the time, because she didn't out herself. But actually, that relationship is important to her story and it's relevant to who she was. So I think today, luckily, we can look from a different perspective and I think it's important that we do. Thank you. Did you say there was another question um, there? Yeah, one from Phil. Um, Phil's been thinking about the 1,000-member espionage ring in Northern Ireland and um, wants to know how large spy rings are funded. Are there traces in the government budgets or is it hidden in budgetary black holes? Oh, that information has not been released, so <laughs> <laughs> if only I knew. But yeah, Phil, I would love to answer that question. Hopefully, 10, 20 years from now, that information will be out there. But I can, I can get into it a bit more. Maybe there's something in the other question I wanted to, to refer to. Um, because there were so many, one of the reasons why there were so many 
agents in operation in Northern Ireland is you had different agencies all trying to find out more. You had MI5, you had the army, you had the police. So you had different budgets. You also had MI6 at various points and GCHQ. And, but just because it's been sort of in my mind in the last couple of minutes, going back to that question of should we be talking about these things that maybe the historical actors themselves wouldn't want us to talk about, steak knife is a figure at the heart mm. of this, and he did not want his story to be told. The police report that was released about a month ago, I was in Belfast for the release of this, and one of the conclusions was that there was a culture of secrecy which led to mistakes being made. And this is the 1980s, and essentially at that time, there was a culture of secrecy which meant that within MI5, within military intelligence, there was a feeling among some people you could get away with more than you could do today. And I think if there's one message from that report is that greater transparency and greater accountability, in other words, more being known about the secret world is a good thing and will lead to fewer mistakes being made. So I think that's another reason why it is important. I think on that note, it's a perfect note to um, close the event. Claire, Henry, thank you ever so much for your time. It's been so interesting. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you.